Okay. So what I want to do is I want to analyze um, a little bit of the nature of Hanukkah and analyze how the, the fundamental basis of Hanukkah makes it that it's not just a unique holiday that happens once a year, but in fact the principle that animates Hanukkah is a uh, sort of a universal Torah principle which allows it to manifest itself in different ways throughout Jewish life. So last year, the way I really came across this topic, last year I was approached by, um, by Magid, the, uh, the publishing house, um, to edit or to really organize the, I don't know if anyone saw the Yom Yom Yom, 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 Yom Yerushalayim Machsor put out by Magid. Anyone see it? So they, they came out with one last year. So I was approached by Magid to put together the essay section. In the back of the book, there's an essay section um, with you know, one article per important Zionist thinker in Israel. <coughs> I didn't have to do the translating. I just had to do the reading, pick, pick articles. Um, so during that process, I had to read through 15, 20 different thinkers, through books of theirs, through articles of theirs, and try to get a feeling for their thought and pick an article that sort of typified their, their view on life and that shed some interesting light on the nature of Yom Atzmaut. And one of the things I found in several pieces was that Yom Atzmaut, the halachic justification for Yom Atzmaut when the Rabbanut had instituted it, um, and the same for Yom Yerushalayim, actually came from their understanding of Hanukkah. So what I want to do is take you through the process that these rabbis went through and show you Right. How it is that the principles, like I said, that, that animate, that, that drive the holiday of Hanukkah really continue to be relevant to the point where it led to the Rabbanut instituting two new holidays, which they saw as the logical extension of the principles of Hanukkah. So, first start at source one. So this is the, this is the Gemara in, Shab- in Shabbat that discusses Hanukkah. So Gemara says, my Hanukkah, what is Hanukkah? What is the reason that we celebrate Hanukkah? The Tanah Rabbanan, because the rabbis taught, the Chathei B'Kislev, Yomei De Hanukkah Tamnai Nun, on the 25th of Kislev, is Hanukkah. There are eight days. Delolu Mispei Bahon, Velolit Anod Bahon. And we can't mourn on them, we can't eulogize on them, we don't fast on them. Why? Shekishenich Nesu Yivanim Lehechal. When the Greeks had come into the temple, Timu kol hashmanim shebeichal, they had made all the oils impure. We know this story. Ukeshe gavram achud beit chasmonai unitzchum, and when the kings of the house of the Hasmoneans beat them, were victorious. Badku v'lo matzu al apach chad shel shemen, they searched and they found but one jug of oil. Shaimunach bechotamau shel kohen gadol. That was sealed with the seal of the high priest. And there was only enough to light for one night. And a miracle occurred. And a miracle happened and it lit for, and it remained lit for eight days. The next year, Kivaum, the Asaum, Yamim Tovim, Bahalel, Vahoda'a. So the next year, they instituted Hanukkah as a days of, uh, of, of thanksgiving and, um, and praise of God. Or that's the story we know. There was the war, we won the war, then we needed to re-inaugurate the Beit HaMikdash, the temple, we were looking for oil to light the menorah, we found one, it lasted for eight days, so we set up Hanukkah, and that's what we know. Now, the Gemara, and I didn't put this for you here, asked the obvious question, right? Hanukkah, what's the nature of the obligation? It's clearly, right, who instituted it? Right, it's clear, the rabbis. Right, this is not biblical. And yet, we all know, tonight, we're going to light our first Hanukkah candles. And what are we going to do? We're going to say three brachot in our nice tune that we have. Um, and what's the first bracha we say? Baruch atah Hashem. What do we say? Asher kidishana v'mitzvotav. You commanded us with your commandments. And the Talmud asked the obvious question, what do you mean, Asher Kitshana Mitzvotav? It's rabbinic. So the Talmud responds, no, it's mitzvah delo tasur. The commandment is the general obligation to listen to the rabbis. 
and sins were bi- biblically obligated to listen to the rabbis. So therefore, when they set up a law, we can say, even though it's not a directly biblical commandment, still, Asher Kedishanam and Mitzvah Tav, at some level, it's an extension of the Mitzvah. But that only highlights the point that Hanukkah, as we know it, is rabbinic. Right? Its association with biblical law is sort of backhanded through Lotus or through the generic obligation to listen to the rabbis, but the holiday itself is unquestionably rabbinic. Now we have another major rabbinic holiday, and that is Purim. And that's in source two. The Gemara describes why is it that we instituted Purim, my Darush, how do they derive that there's this notion of Purim from the Torah, Amr Bichia Bar Avin, Amr Bishu Ben Karcha, Uma Me Abdul Khairud, Amrin Amrin and Shira. If from slavery to freedom, referring to what holiday? Pesa, we institute a holiday, we have Thanksgiving, we praise God, Mimita Lachayim Lokal Shikane. So Purim, when we went from death to life. And we were all threatened with annihilation, not just slavery, so how much more so do we have to set up a holiday? So these are the two rabbinic holidays, Hanukkah and Purim. But, if we look at the Gemara carefully, right, while it's clear in the Gemara and Shabbat that Hanukkah is rabbinic, and its association with the biblical law is through Lotus or through the general obligation to listen to the rabbis. Here, in the Gemara in Megillah, we have an interesting phrase. And when the Gemara is trying to figure out the source for Purim, what does it say? It says, My Darush. Now, Darush normally means, right, from Jirashah. How did we exegetically derive it from the Torah? I mean, what did we see in the Psukim? What did we see in the actual verses of the Torah? that led us to create this holiday, which is a little bit odd, because as we already noted, it's undeniable that the holidays of Hanukkah and Purim are not actually biblical. Right? We have to listen to the rabbis, and that's why they're associated with biblical law, but they're not biblical. So what do you mean, my darush? What do you mean? How did we derive it from the Torah? So one could just say that it's just what we call an asmachta. It's an illusion. It's a rhetorical device to, you know, a rhetorical flourish. That really it's not biblical at all. But we find a pasuk or we find a concept in the Torah that we can hang our hats on. That we say, well, this is sort of as if in some way it is biblical. But really, really it's not biblical. It's just rabbinic. But there's another possibility. And that's introduced in Source 3 by the Chatam Sofer, by Ramosha Sofer. Before we see it inside, right, let me ask you. If I asked you, is there a biblical value to thanking God um, when you've been saved from danger? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, right? Give me proof. Oh, we say um, uh, or something. You know. I mean, we, <laughs> right, meaning we, we always, right, we have all these bracho that we say. Yeah, we have but if you look at the psukim, right, let's look at the psukim, right, the Gemara's example, right, Ma Abdullah Khairud Amrin and Shira. When did they say Shira, right? When did they say song for, for Pesach? So we say Halal, sure, but where else did they say it? At Kriyat Yamsu. At Kriyat they said Az Yashir, right? You look at the Torah, it's not like this is a new idea to praise God for salvation, right? If we just look, we'll look through other things, right? Let's look through the, through the Avo, right? Yaakov Avinu says that if God saves me, what will I do? I'll give him 10% of my money. I'll give Maaser as thanks to God, right? He, there's a, a value that, per, that permeates every part of the Torah, that if God does something for you, then you have to respond. You have to show your recognition, right? You continue through the Psukim, right? Take, take your pick. Right? They have Shira later on when they have the man, when they're going into Eretz Israel, where we have Karbanot. We constantly have praise of different sorts, whether it's through song, whether it's through mm-hmm. sacrifices. Mm-hmm. Right? We see it by Avram. We have all of Sefer Tehillim, which is 150 chapters of praise and prayer. So if I ask you, is it really true that this notion of praising God is rabbinic? One would look at the Torah and say, undeniably, no. Right? 
Praising God seems to be part and parcel of what it means to be a Torah Jew. Forget rabbinic Jew, just a Torah Jew. So the Chatam Sofer picks up on that. And especially the fact that in source 2 it said, My Darush, which sounds like where do they derive the basis for Purim, which is rabbinic, from the Torah itself. And he says, well, Kriat Yom Mo'ed, Biyom Asiat Nais, the establishment of a holiday on the day of a miracle, who Kalvachomer to Oraita, is a biblical obligation based on an a fortiori argument, which the Latin for Kalvachomer, meaning what the Gemara did before. If from life, if from slavery to freedom we sing, then how much more so from death to life? Right, that type of argument is saying I'm looking straight at the biblical text and I'm deriving a logical argument straight from what I know, from what God tells us in the Torah itself, and I'm saying if Pesach is a holiday, then Purim should be a holiday. I'm sorry, did you say that Purim is not biblical? Right, Purim is not biblical in the sense of Chumash. Right, it comes in Navi, but we don't normally attribute, right, I should clarify that, we don't tribu attribute biblical status to anything post, right, the sealing of Chumash. Now, Purim, as opposed to Hanukkah, right, Purim at least has a safer enough in Navi, in, in Nuvim and Suvim, right, it has Megillah and Esther, and Hanukkah doesn't even, right, the, the apocryphal books um, remained in the apocrypha, Maccabees 1, 2, etc. Despite the fact that Maccabees 1 sounds biblical, right, you open it up, it's a little bit hard to sound biblical just because Maccabees 1, we've lost the Hebrew, the Hebrew version of it thousands of years ago, so what we have is the... Uh, Latin, Greek translation of it and what most people read is the English translation of the Greek translation of it but if you read the King James version of it you will feel the same as if you were reading Psukim but you're right there is no book for Hanukkah and there is for Purim but it's still post biblical in the narrow sense of the Bible the, like the Chumash um, and Purim itself is clearly not you know one of the 613 mitzvot now it's true that the Rishonim, right, the medieval commentary, is given a middle status. Right? Hanukkah may be totally rabbinic, and Purim may be what's called Divrei Nevi'im. It comes from the words of the prophet, so it's a middle status. But it's not biblical, biblical. Right? It doesn't find its source in Chumash. But the Chatam Sofer said it's not just that Purim and Hanukkah are, let's say, prophetic. He thinks they're biblical, like biblical in the narrow sense. Biblical in the five books of Moses, biblical. Why? And he says, well, what did the Talmud say? The Talmud said that there's a direct argument from Pesach. If Pesach is a holiday and all we did was become free, then Purim must be a holiday because we were saved. So he says, and um, if you continue, Lufi and in my humble opinion, Lufi Yom Purim Vimei Chanukah De Oraitahim. So Purim and Chanukah are not just rabbinic. They're not just... Um, they're not just prophetic, they're biblical. And I, I you know, I, I don't even know how to do that little sign above the H in Hanukkah here, but this is because because I edited the, the book. I asked the editor-in-chief to send me the translations they did for the official book. So this is, uh, this is their official translation. Um, but what are we supposed to do? Right, how exactly is it going to be expressed? English law. Come on out, right, we have different options. On Purim, we decide that how do we celebrate Purim? Through celebration. We send food to other people. We have a big meal. Right? That's how we do Purim. And on Hanukkah, Ola Hadlik we light candles. Ola Acher, and we could have done anything else. Zehu Dirabanan. So he said the choice of how to celebrate is rabbinic. But the principle that you need to find a way, whether it be sacrifices, whether it be meals, whether it be challah, whether it be candles, whether it be the Megillah, whatever it is, that's rabbinic. But the principle, the rabbis are not being driven just because they want to make a holiday. There's a biblical principle here, which is, whenever God saves you, whenever you owe something to God, you need to find a way to show your gratitude. All the rabbis did. That which we mean when we say that Purim and Hanukkah are rabbinic isn't that the principle is rabbinic. It's that God left it open. Show your thanks in some way. Hanukkah and Purim, the rabbis decided this is how we're going to show thanks. They 
formalized a sort of amorphous biblical principle and created holidays the way they did. So he continues, over but therefore one who violates Hanukkah Purim, Ve'ena Ose Shum Zecher Lame Hanukkah Purim, and doesn't do anything for Hanukkah or Purim, over on Mitzvah Asei, Dilraita, is neglectful and violates a biblical positive command. So the Chatam Sofer introduces a fascinating theory, which is that Hanukkah and Purim are not truly rabbinic. They're rabbinic only in the sense that the rabbis told us how to thank God on Hanukkah and Purim. But the notion that when God saved you, you have to set up a holiday because you need to show thanks, you need to recognize what he did for you, that is biblical, that runs through the entirety of the Torah. Now in the continuation of the Chatam Sofer's Shuva, he uses this to justify why there was a custom in Europe that when individual towns were saved from a pogrom, from a fire, from what have you, they would set up their own personal holidays. And he says that notion that we set up holidays isn't just a nice thing. It's biblical. And he says, I'll prove it to you. Hanukkah and Purim teach you this critical principle that you have to set up a day. You have to set up a time to thank God when he did something for you. If you don't, you're missing the point of the Torah. But it's not, and now he adds, it's not just Hanukkah and Purim. It's any time something happened to you, you have to set up a holiday. You have to show thanks to God. So now, we move to 1948. And we move to 1967. And suddenly, we have a generation of rabbis who are faced with a question that had not faced the Jewish people in 2,000 years. Which is, it's not just local. It wasn't my little town, my shtetl in Europe, my little town in North Africa was saved from a program, from crusaders, from who knows what. Suddenly, for the first time, we have a nation who's saved. Right? We, we had the Holocaust, and then we had miraculous three, miraculously three years later, through political miracles and military miracles, the UN grants us a state. We win the battles of independence. We managed to survive. In 67, we fight against incredible odds. And we managed to conquer Yushalayim, conquer Yushalayim and the Golan and Gush Etzion. And now they say, well, what is the proper response? So it's not surprising that many of them looked at the Khatam Sofer, which became a very famous piece, and said, wait a second, we know what to do because the rabbis had the same question 2,000 years ago, which was, this is what happened in Hanukkah. And we know, right, we know the drill. So, just to give one example, this is the Shuk Kol Mavasar, this is from Shulam Rath, who I put in the English, if you look in the, in the italics, I put his biography, just so you... See what we're talking about. Rumashul Mrath, descendant of a noted rabbinic family, he was born in 1875 in Poland. He quickly became fo- famous as a child prodigy and was ordained as a rabbi at age 18. Later he, later, he served as a rabbi in Romania. Long after the Zionist mo- movement, Rath immigrated to Israel in 1949. Before long, he became an active member of the Israeli Chief Rabbinate Council, and he served as a halachic advisor to Israel's chief rabbis and to Israel's supreme rabbinical court. Rath's response to deal with many problems of the fledging state of Israel in its early years. Right? So he, this is He's, he's in that circle of people who's grappling with the reality of the new state. So here's his tshuva about Yom Ha'atzmaut. And he writes, It seems obvious in our case. Which is relevant to the entire community of Israel. And we, have, we went from, we have deliverance from slavery to freedom. Because we were redeemed from the subjugation of kingdoms we become free and we've achieved political independence and we also have life to death in other words we have both Hanukkah and Purim because Hanukkah is about getting our independence right the Beit Hashmonai the reestablishing at least for 200 years a kingship in Israel and it's Purim, because we were on the verge of being annihilated. Right? So this is Hanukkah and Purim all wrapped into one. We were saved from our enemies. 
that tried to destroy us, and he's borrowing that language from where? Behisha Amda, because he's saying this is this is everything. This is Pesach. This is Mitz, this is Hanukkah. This is Purim, all wrapped in one. Bivadai Chova Aleinu Lekvoa Yom Tov. We must set up a holiday. And it makes sense that the people who set up the holiday set up this day because that was the day of the central miracle. Where we went from slavery to freedom through that original decree, right? That original statement, the Declaration of Independence. And what you see is that they thought that the principles that drive Hanukkah didn't end with Hanukkah. Because if the Khatam Sofer is right, that means that we have a perpetual obligation to recognize God's hand in this world and do something to show our thanks, to show our gratitude. So the logical conclusion of Hanukkah, of Purim, of Pesach, is Yom Matzmaut and Yom Yerushalayim. But now I want to make just a few more points. I mean, I think the principle is clear, but just to flesh it out, right? First, we should know right, that even if this is true, right, how do we know, right, and this is, you know, going to, the, the, going to be the response, but one of the questions that people ask is, let's say you're right, that you should set up a holiday when there's a miracle, when you get political independence, when you're saved. But who says that 1948, setting up a secular admittedly, very admittedly, flawed government is a reason to celebrate. Right? That was one of the questions that was, was, was posed to them. Because if you're turning to a religious Zionist thinker, no religious Zionist thinker is going to say the ideal state is a secular state run by people who are anti-religious. Right? That, that no one's going to say. So how do you know that that is something that you should celebrate? So many of them responded by pointing to the way the Rambam describes um, the uh, describes Pesach as uh, Hanukkah itself, rather. Now we should know that the in Hanukkah, right? Again, who became the kings? The Hasmoneans, the Hasmoneans, right? Now, how many generations were the Hasmoneans good religious kings? One or two. One or two. How long did their monarchy last? About two hundred years. Which means that we're celebrating a holiday which set up, set in motion, a very imperfect political sovereignty in Israel. Right? A very not religious, anti religious government. That's what happened. Right? You read what, ha- the, the, what the Hashmanim do later, it's not pretty. Okay? And yet, if you look at the Rambam's description, and this is um, source 5. <laughs> In the era of the Second Temple, the Greeks kin, the Greek kingdom issued decrees against the Jewish people, attempting to nullify their faith and refusing uh, to allow them to observe the Tarnas commandments. And they took their money and their and their daughters and they they went into the Beit Hamikdash. They breached it. They made the pure impure. Until God, our Savior, saved us. And the kings. From Beit Hashmonai, the priests killed the enemies, Voshil Israel, Israel Miadam, and saved the Jews, Vemidu Melech Menakonim, and set up a priestly king, Vichazra Machut Li Israel, Yetel Matem Shana Korban Sheni. And we got political sovereignty for 200 years until the destruction of the temple. And they note that the Rambam says that what was the miracle for which we celebrate? That we got political sovereignty for 200 years. And many people make this point. The, the article that I was just taking these translations from is an article by Ruchaim Druckmann, who is a current rabbi in Israel, but I've heard this from Mori Virabi Aravami Tal, Zatzal, many times, right, that the Rambam is clear that when we thank God on Hanukkah, we're thanking Him even though we recognize the imperfections of what came after Hanukkah. Because when we thank God, we don't just thank God for the perfect, we thank Him for the imperfect too. And the Rambam is saying we celebrate the 200 years, even though 150 of those were not so pretty. Still, it was better than what we had. Being under somewhat corrupt Jewish kings, we're still better than what we had under the Greeks. 
And that's enough to obligate us to thank God. So it's not just that there's a biblical obligation to recognize what God does for us. There's a biblical obligation to thank God for what we have, even when we can say, right, bepemale, full, right, full, wholeheartedly, that we understand that this is not perfect. And still we have to thank God for the good, even if we know it's not perfect. We can strive for change and for improvement. But right, the Zionist argument against those who would say, well, it's not perfect, so don't recognize it, is no. We recognize everything God gives us, even with all of its imperfections and all of the frailties of the people who are involved. Still, we have to recognize and we have to thank for what we do have and recognize the greatness of, of what we got, even if we might have wished for more. So that's a point that sort of, you know, pushes this a little bit farther. That it's not just that we thank God, you know, when we have this perfect miracle in Mitzrayim, where God, you know, wipes away our enemies, and we have Moshe Rabbeinu speaking to God as our leader, which, okay, that period was not so perfect either, but, you know, okay, Moshe Rabbeinu is a pretty good leader, even if we recognize that the leaders we get are, okay, you know, they are who they are, there's problems still. Don't let that wipe away in your mind what it is God gave you. You still have to recognize it. Now, in 1992, this is source six, the Tradition Journal had a symposium um, of people talking about their reflections on the Six Day War, right? It was 25 years after 67. Now, one of the respondents there was Dr. David Berger. He's the current dean of the Bernard Revel Graduate School at Yeshiva University. He's always a very sharp, very sharp person. Makes very, very acute insights. So he's talking about it, and he makes a point which I think is critical to think about this. And he says, well, there's more at stake than just recognizing what, you know, that we have to thank God. Thanking God is really a recognition of an even more basic tenet of faith, which is that God is involved. And to thank God is to recognize that God is involved. And to not thank God is, perforce, a denial of God's involvement in history. Right? Because if someone were to turn around and say, well, that was Chazal, right? that was... That was the, or that was Mordechai and Esther. That was two and a half thousand years ago. But we, we can't say that we see God's hand. You're denying a basic tenet of faith, which is that God is involved in history, and that didn't stop with the closing of Tanakh. And he says, and that's why he thinks that he's a Zionist, because he says, in the end of the day, religious Zionism is the recognition that God, of the basic Jewish faith, that God's hand continues to guide us throughout history, more hidden, more open, we can argue. But the basic notion that we have to continuously recognize that God is involved in our lives is, in the end of the day, the basis of religious Zionism. And he, I, I put a long quote from him because he, he writes it very nicely. Um, the original is in English. Um, and this is six. So he says, In determining whether a particular historical process is a miracle, conce- context is almost everything. For the non-believer, the context of faith is entirely absent. And for such a person, the Israeli capture of Jerusalem, the unraveling of communism, the events of the Gulf War, can reasonably be attributed to social, political, military, or economic factors. Where faith is present, context takes on a broader meaning, encompassing both both theology and historical evaluation. Do I believe that God intervenes frequently, even in everyday affairs of relatively little moment? Do I think that this is a period of hester panim, of God's face being hidden, in which natural processes almost invariably prevail? Do I consider divine intervention more likely in Jewish history than the affairs of the nations of the world? Do I assign a positive, negative, or neutral evaluation to the event under consideration? Do I regard it as a passing episode or as a critical development in human history? Although God's knowledge is unlimited and the possibility of, in, of his intervention is always present, many major authorities have maintained that miraculous intervention in the daily lives of ordinary Jews is relatively infrequent and some degree of uncertainty extends to larger matters as well. I am inclined to believe, for example, that God had something to do with the low causality rate following the launching of Scud missiles towards Israel, but I do not feel that my faith requires the categorical affirmation that he changed the flight path of a particular missile or caused its warhead to malfunction. Nevertheless, 
there are events that are so earth-shaking within the context of Jewish, be- uh, of Jewish belief that the failure to attribute them to divine intervention leaves Judaism bereft of meaningful faith in the God of Chazal and of the prophets. The establishment of the state of Israel and the capture of Jerusalem are such events. Given the most fundamental assumptions about providence, the goodness of God and his concern for the Jewish people, the position that developments of such magnitude come about wholly through the working of an impersonal historical process is inadmissible. It banishes God from history and declares in effect that the Lord has forsaken the earth. If the hand of God is not to be found in these events, where is it to be found? One of the great ironies in contemporary Jewish piety is that many deeply religious Jews have inverted the hierarchy of providential events. For many non-Zionist Orthodox Jews, the operation of micro-providence, right, hashkacha pratis, in your, in your life, is taken for granted to the point where innumerable, innumerable events in the lives of prominent rabbis are confidently regarded as miracles. At the same time, the return of the land of Israel to the Jewish people is assigned no religious value whatever. It is true that God intervenes to protect the land. He guides God missiles to, to targets of bricks and stone in large measure because of the merit generated by students studying in Israel yeshiva. Nonetheless, he appears to have played no role in the establishment of the state. This position is so incongruous that it is rarely, if ever, formulated in such stark terms. Nevertheless, I believe that it is a fair extrapolation from the rhetoric and behavior of many religious Jews. And he never pulls his punches. Um, I had the pleasure once of, uh, of responding to a paper in an academic conference where the two respondents were me and David Berger because I was in a fellowship with, at the Tikva Fund, so it was one fellow and one senior academic person. That was not pretty for the person being responded to. Um, but David Berger makes a very striking point. He says, wait a second, the whole... In our world, you go around, everyone, hashkacha pratis this, hashkacha pratis that. There's book after book after book about the little things in your lives. And then there are whole swaths of the Jewish people who can at the same moment say, well, you know, I pulled this coin out of my pocket because of hashkacha pratis at exactly the time to put it in my, uh, in my shopping cart. But then God, three years after the Holocaust, has an open miracle and saves us and you're going to deny it? That is denying the, as he says, the faith of the prophets and Chazal. I mean, what is Hanukkah in Purim if not the ability of Jews to recognize that the historical <laughs> events of history have someone guiding them? Right? This is the principle of Torah. Right? That God acts in history. And as David Berger says, he's not the type of person who insists that every scud missile, when it didn't hit was because God actively intervened. Right? And you don't necessarily have to believe that. You can have a limited view of what hashkacha means and say that you don't think that every little thing, I have to believe that God did it actively, and I can think that God lets nature run its course. But to say that about the big things, to not recognize what God did is to deny the Tanakh. It's to deny what Chazal saw when they set up Hanukkah, when they set up Purim. So I think that what he adds to this is that it's not just it's a denial of gratitude, but not having gratitude is per force a denial of providence. And then, you know, just to, to right, put it in different words, if you look in 7, this is from uh, the translation of the article that I mentioned by Rabbi Druckmann, where he just, you know, brings it all together. And he says, The many into the hands of the few. Now, this is what he calls the section. Right? Rabim miyad miyatim, what we say in al He says, on the eve of the declaration of independence of the state of Israel, the Arab countries declared that within a week they intended to wipe out the entire Yeshuv, the entire Jewish population in the land of Israel. The Arab army's proclamation, we will drive you into the sea, was not a figure of speech, but rather a, a serious threat to invade the land of Israel from the north, east, and south, so that the Mediterranean Sea to the west would, would, to the west would be the Jews' last refuge. Is there a better example of the many into the hands of the few? On Hanukkah, we repeatedly recite the al in prayer in which we thank God for delivering the many into the hands of the few. The Hanukkah miracle took place more than 2,000 years ago, but this wondrous event has happened also in our time. God delivered the many into the hands of the few and thus saved us from certain death and gave us the gift of our own lives. Is it not appropriate that we thank him for this? And I think taking all of it together, I think analyzing how Postkin dealt with the connection between Hanukkah and using it as a model for Yom Yerushalayim and Yom Atzvahot, right brings out several central ideas. First of all, that right, the basic idea of the, Cham, the Chazam Sober, that Hanukkah and Purim may be rabbinic in the sense that they told us how to celebrate it, but the notion that we have to show thanks 
is central to biblical Judaism, right? Not rabbinic Judaism, biblical Judaism, and not doing that is being derelict in our most basic responsibilities. Point two, based on the Rambam, is that when we thank God, it's not just for the perfect. It's for the imperfect too. And point three is that we, re- we have to recognize that if we aren't gracious, we don't show gratitude to God, we're not just being unthankful. We're denying something even more basic, that God continues to be involved in history. And at some level, the ability of the, those rabbis in 48 and 67 to look and say, this is Hanukkah again, this is Purim again, testifies to the continuing ability of the Jewish people to believe and respond to God's involvement in Jewish history. So I think the connection from Hanukkah to Yom Atzimut is the reminder right, that Hanukkah is supposed to teach us that God's hand continues to be, in, be involved in our lives and that we need to respond accordingly.